Do you ever find yourself wondering if maybe nothing matters at all? Well, when it comes to the cosmos above our heads, below our feet and swirling all around us, nothing, or really the complete absence of anything, happens to matter very, very much. In a universe teeming with stars, planets, mysterious dark matter, and all manner of space rocks and ice chunks, there are an abundance of astrophysical puzzles to be solved. But it's the corners of the universe where, for some strange and inexplicable reason, there is nothing at all is perhaps where the biggest mysteries lie. So in today's installment of Astrographics, we're going to peer into the voids, quite literally, and figure out just why in these vast expanses of space there is nothing, when really there should be something. To find a great intergalactic void, a space so empty that it resists human expectations on what the known universe should be, you'd think oh, we might really have to go looking. The reality, though, is that if we're going to find a cosmic void, we need only look a few light years past our own doorstep. The science journalist Miriam Frankel titled an article for New Scientist, quoting here, We live in a cosmic void so empty that it breaks the laws of cosmology. And Frankel's not exaggerating either. Although the evidence isn't quite so strong as to form a consensus, planet Earth is increasingly understood to be part of one of the greatest cosmic voids that humanity has identified. It's referred to as the local hole, alternately known as the KBC void after the astronomers who identified it back in 2013, but simply calling it local hole considerably understates just how vast this thing truly is. The KBC void stretches a diameter estimated to be roughly 2 billion light years. That's about 600 megaparsecs. So far, in fact, that just for perspective, a 600 megaparsec radius around Earth would account for nearly the entire portion of our universe that humans have been able to map. Of course, the KBC void isn't completely empty. After all, we are inside it, as is the entire Milky Way and the entire local group of nearby galaxies like Andromeda. Our local group, for reference, is about 3 megaparsecs across, while our entire supercluster of galaxies, the Lanikia supercluster, fits inside it as well. The Laniakea supercluster holds some 100,000 galaxies, stretching across 160 megaparsecs, holding an incredible amount of mass by any human metric. And yet, in comparison to the KBC void that surrounds us, even our galactic supercluster is very small. Compared to what the rest of the universe holds, in places where galaxies cluster in a way that astronomers and scientists would call normal, the KBC void is practically empty. And all of us inside the void are nearly entirely alone. The KBC void is so big as to defy human expectations on how the universe should work. The spread out matter of the universe will unavoidably cluster sometimes into areas of higher or lower concentration. A galaxy, for example, would be a high concentration area, while the empty space immediately surrounding that galaxy would of course be empty. But in a much broader sense, matter should, in theory, be distributed relatively evenly across the cosmos. Look at the known universe and chop out, say, a hundred chunks of space that are each a megaparsec wide, a megaparsec long, and a megaparsec tall, and despite the unique arrangements of matter inside those samples, they should all contain roughly the same amount of stuff. But even just by looking at our own KBC void, we know that those expectations simply do not hold up. Even with much of the Laniac Air supercluster within its limits, it is so much emptier than it should be that it's nearly an impossibility under most interpretations of how the cosmos should work. Roughly spheroid in shape, the KBC void is surrounded by what amounts to a shell, other galaxies, other stars floating out in the nothingness, as well as other matter, all of which we can observe quite clearly using the technology that we have on Earth. There's no discernible barrier to any of that matter moving closer to the Milky Way or infringing on the KBC void, and yet it doesn't. It's easy enough to understand why other matter wouldn't float into the KBC void right now. After all, areas with higher mass also have higher gravity, pulling all of that mass towards itself and preventing it from floating away into nothingness. But it's far harder to work out why such a void would have come about in the first place. The KBC void isn't the only one either, and it's certainly not the only gigantic one. One of the other behemoths of the cosmos is aptly named Giant Void, alternately known as the Keynes Venetici Supervoid, sitting about 1.5 billion light years from Earth at its center. The Giant Void measures about 300 to 400 megaparsecs across, that's about 1 to 1.3 billion light years. Inside are 17 different galaxy clusters, but even stranger, those galaxy clusters too are clustered into a roughly spheroid shape in one particular 
particular region of the Great Void instead of spread throughout. Although they're relatively close to each other, the clusters are believed to act on each other gravitationally. They're not very dense, and as a result, their proximity to each other simply isn't enough to cause a strong gravitational effect. There's an even bigger void out there, too, and it goes by the catchy name of LOWZ North 13788, and it holds no fewer than 109,000 known galaxies in an otherwise empty void that measures nearly 3 billion light years across. There's the Boots Void, a spheroid structure 62 megaparsecs or 330 million light years across that should, mathematically speaking, hold about 2,000 galaxies, but instead holds only 60. Then there's the Taurus Void, not far from the Milky Way, on the other side of the Virgo supercluster of galaxies, although the Taurus Void is difficult to study since it's an area obscured from Earth by the rest of the Milky Way. And there's the Great Void, also known as the Cold Spot or the Eridanus Super Void, that's thought to span up to 300 megaparsecs, where it sits some 6 to 10 billion light years away. And even more perplexing, these voids seem as if they fit inside a structure that's almost too grand in its scale to comprehend. Galaxy clusters travel in winding knots through them. They cut through them in dense sheets of matter, so as to separate one void from another, and they weave together in a vast coiling architecture that makes up our known universe. The voids, and with them the even greater supervoids, are what remains in the space they leave behind. Far larger than any galaxy, to be sure, but seemingly a part of that same great superstructure. Now, when we imagine a cosmic void, it's easy to imagine simple emptiness. But we know for a fact that that's not the case. For direct evidence to immediately disprove an idea, look no further than your own mirror. We, after all, are part of a galactic supercluster at the heart of our own great void. Ask what happens in such a void, that'd be us. But that also means that supervoids are full of all the stuff beyond our world that we can clearly see. Even the greatest voids contain galaxies inside, and inside those galaxies are stars, nebulas, planets, black holes, comets, asteroids, and so much more. In intergalactic space, there are occasional rocky chunks, things like asteroids and even rogue planets, and once in a while there might even be a star cast adrift by the gigantic interactions between galaxies. One 2012 study published in the Astrophysical Journal indicates that trillions of stars could exist out in the universe's countless intergalactic regions, implying that a whole lot of them probably exist even within a cosmic void. And even more important is all the matter that's too small to see. Cosmic voids are significantly lower density than the more populated regions of space that host the majority of galaxies, but there's still a whole lot of stuff there. In fact, there's so much stuff there that even galactic superclusters like ours in the KBC void don't account for it all. Intergalactic space is filled with gas, mostly hot hydrogen ions, but also heavier elements like carbon, silicon, oxygen, among others. There's not a lot of it in any given spot, but it absolutely matters. Quoting astronomer Michael Schull speaking to Live Science back in 2019, if you took a cubic meter, there would be less than one atom in it. But when you add it all up, it's somewhere between 50 to 80 percent of all the ordinary matter out there. In galactic voids, that ratio might be a good bit lower, but it also may not be. And that's an area where future study will almost certainly be required to work out an answer. But certainly even these parts of the universe where it seems like there's nothing still do have something. The only question is how much something they have. But if most matter is largely absent from cosmic voids, there's one key exception. Neutrinos. Elementary particles that interact only with gravity and the weak nuclear force, neutrinos have an exceptionally small mass and are electrically neutral. They wash across the entire universe, including constantly through our own bodies in incredible numbers, but do so in a way where interactions are exceptionally rare. But neutrinos are completely unrestricted in the way that they run through cosmic voids. By studying neutrinos, scientists may be able to further examine the nature of cosmic voids, something that the recently launched Euclid satellite of the Europe European Space Agency should be able to help with. In fact, voids are one of the few places that the tiny mass of individual neutrinos and their nearly negligible gravitational effects actually matter. When taken en masse, the gravitational effect of neutrinos may cause voids to grow relatively slowly in today's universe, holding together the void's disparate bits of matter through a very weak, 
but still meaningful gravitational effect. But the lingering question behind all cosmic voids is the same no matter what goes on inside each one. How do these voids actually form and why do they exist? Gravity provides some level of an answer here, and certainly gravity bears at least some responsibility for supervoids being the way they are. Galaxies exert massive amounts of gravity on the space around them, and galaxies and other celestial objects work in a way that should bring them together rather than push them apart. That provides some explanation for the vast superstructure structures that exist around these voids, made up of matter that should be gravitationally attractive to the matter near it. Over the course of billions of years, those gravitational structures will pull each other into a sort of formation, forming not only galaxy clusters and superclusters, but the larger filaments that seem to make up our universe's largest structures. But while gravity can explain some of the phenomena, it can't explain the whole thing. To illustrate why not, Let's imagine a supervoid, say 100 megaparsecs wide. It makes sense that galaxies that are near enough to each other to feel each other's gravity will eventually cluster together. But it does not make sense to assume that the galaxies that should be at the center of a supervoid would be pulled all the way to its outer edges by galaxies dozens of megaparsecs away. That's simply too far for those other galaxies to have a significant gravitational effect. And even if they did, there should be other galaxies closer to the center of the supervoid that would be an effective counterweight. That's that's why, in a universe where matter is supposed to be distributed roughly evenly, supervoids shouldn't exist. The gravity of faraway cosmic structures, even if those structures are really big, shouldn't be enough to overcome the gravitational pull of structures that are closer in proximity, including galaxy clusters and even single galaxies. That push and pull should help keep the distribution of matter relatively constant. And in the case of these galactic voids, it's not enough to say that gravity slowly pulls the matter inside the supervoids toward the outer edges. There should be enough mass inside the area to keep gravitational balance, but inexplicably, the area is a supervoid instead. In order for that to make sense, something else had to act on these regions of space before the gravitational pull of far-off galaxies even becomes a factor. But wind back the clock to a more primordial universe, and the origins of the interstellar voids may come into better focus. Many astrophysicists believe that the voids are a relic of a time long gone by, during the early expansion of the universe. Even then, the universe's matter is thought to have been mostly uniform, but it was a lot more densely packed, leading to far greater gravitational interactions between parts of the universe that are today much too far apart to ever act on each other. In the universe's early moments, shifts in density in some areas would have led to gravitationally induced collapse, pulling a matter towards those points and away from others. Then, as the universe spreads out, everything cools down and matter begins to come to rest. Areas with higher concentrations of matter Matter would have kept that matter all clumped up neatly, while areas without as much matter would have looked emptier and emptier as space itself expanded. More empty space for the same amount of not very much matter means areas of relatively lower and lower density, and eventually you get a great old void. Meanwhile, the gravitational effects in these higher matter density areas would have kept matter structured into the same strands, walls, sheets, and other filaments that we mentioned, giving the entire universe a sort of Swiss cheese architecture. Matter in some places, voids taking up the rest. Over time, the matter of those high density areas would have formed into galaxies, while the voids got bigger and colder, and the higher concentrations of matter inside them, the galaxy clusters and things like that, lose their ability to act gravitationally on the other matter within the void. This explanation of supervoids is helped along by the evidence provided by cosmic background radiation, microwave radiation that dates back to about 380,000 years following the Big Bang. That radiation is pretty much homogenous across the universe, suggesting that when it was generated, the universe was broadly homogenous too. But that to have changed now suggests that supervoids aren't a complication within our understanding of the universe but that they were, at some point, created. And helping the whole process along is dark matter. Now, we're not going to belabor a whole explanation of what dark matter is for this particular episode, other than to emphasize that it's matter that humans are pretty sure, in a mathematical sense, does exist, that can't perceive using the tools and technologies that we have. 
But by adding dark matter into the high-density areas of the universe, at or around the time when the separation of voids and filaments would have really kicked off, we're able to further explain why that separation was so stark. Add in a whole lot of dark matter in these high-density areas and the gravitational pull those areas exert would have been a whole lot stronger than we would otherwise assume. High-density regions would have clustered together a lot faster and a lot more starkly in contrast to the universe around them. Recent studies have suggested the Milky Way itself might have significantly less dark matter than would be expected of the average galaxy, supporting, in turn, the idea that dark matter, like the matter uh, we can observe, would cluster in filaments and not in cosmic voids like ours. One thing that probably has little to do with supervoids, though, are black holes. Although it's tempting to wonder whether a supervoid might result from a supermassive black hole, one that swells so big that it's eaten everything its gravitational pull can capture and just leaves nothingness in the aftermath, that's pretty unlikely. On the one hand, it's not particularly feasible that the amount of matter available in normally distributed space would ever be enough to fuel a supermassive black hole to that size. On the other, even black holes are subject to the same limitations in gravity as everything else in the universe. Their reach only extends so far. And not only that, but if these voids were caused by black holes, the planets, stars, and galaxies that do persist there would have been swallowed long ago. Those galaxies, by the way, include our own and everyone watching this. And speaking of, here on Earth, it's difficult to know how precisely our place within a cosmic void might impact our galactic neighborhood. After all, we can't claim to have accounted for what it's like in parts of the universe that we can't directly study. And for all we know, perhaps the universe works somewhat differently in those grand cosmic filaments of galaxies than it does here. Perhaps, for example, there's some sort of radiation effect there that we can't conceive of, where planets like ours, in their own star habitable range but awash in the cosmic radiation of galaxies close by could never host life like ours. Or perhaps we're missing out on whatever happens there. Perhaps we're missing out on a universe teeming with life because we're simply too far away to receive the signals that would be abundant elsewhere. Maybe advanced intelligent life only happens once or twice in a given galaxy in every eon or so, but expands rapidly outward once it's able, meaning that in other parts of the universe, even a quiet galaxy would be awash in signs of intelligence from many galaxies nearby. And while we're on the subject of other forms of intelligent life, we'll conclude on the topic of silence and the emptiness that any potential life forms looking out from the center of a supervoid almost certainly know well. Said astronomer Greg Aldering of the sheer strangeness of what it must be like inside one, quote, if the Milky Way had been in the center of the boots void, we wouldn't have known there were other galaxies in the universe until the 1960s. That's not to say that an alien being looking up at our own night sky would have seen nothing. That's more like what it would be to look up from the surface of a lone rogue planet barreling through nothingness at the center of nothingness. A civilization trying to understand its place in a lone supervoid galaxy would still understand that galaxy. But beyond that, there would be nothing until science one day advanced to a point that it could illuminate the vast cosmos beyond. Today, scientists estimate that humanity has identified well upward of five to six thousand individual voids. And as our means to measure the cosmos improves, the count of observed voids is all but certain to rise exponentially. In the powerful contrast they provide between some parts of the universe and others, they're certain to lend a powerful insight to the cosmos that we live in. And they've proven immensely helpful in explaining scientific mysteries that still elude us. A void, by definition, is nothing, or at least close to nothing. But by seeking to understand cosmic voids, we could end up understanding everything.